Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our town hall meeting tonight. Uh, very excited that it's not just me. We've also got uh, Renee Bohm, our council president, and Larry Hall, who is our lead elder, and Pastor John. They're with us as well. Uh, they're here via Zoom, and so we're all spread out. This is going to be uh, very interesting tonight to see if we can get all of this to work. So I'm here at Valley Creek Sanctuary. Um, Joel Semenk is here as well. He's going to be helping with uh, some of the questions as they come in, as we get to that point in our, our time together uh, tonight. Just a couple of, of housekeeping things along the way. Again, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Glad that you're going to be spending this time with us. Um, we don't know how long we're going to go. Uh, maybe 45 minutes, maybe an hour things get really exciting, maybe an hour and a half, I don't know. Um, hopefully we're out of here in an hour. Um, this will be the first probably of several town halls before we would say, hey, yeah, we're voting to merge with Concordia. And so um, we're going to attempt to answer a lot of questions by going through a whole bunch of information tonight. Um, but if you have questions that come up along the way, um, you can go ahead and hit the live prayer button. Uh, we know that lots of you are using that during our worship services, but if you hit the live prayer button, um, you can go ahead and you can enter your questions there. Um, you're not allowed to do that quite yet, though. I want you to listen to, to what we go through. Um, I think we're going to answer a lot of questions that are on your minds now, but if we don't, um, you're certainly welcome. Again, hit that prayer, uh, live prayer button and go ahead and, and put a question in uh, that way. Um, for tonight, basically the, the roadmap for our evening is we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Concordia, kind of who they are, uh, where they're located, a little bit about their facilities and ministry, uh, some of their history. Um, Pastor John has been in conversation with folks from Concordia for probably six months, a year, um, you know, the, the conversation moved from how can we come beside y'all and just give you some support and help um, to maybe a merger might be the, the right thing. And so Pastor John will lead us through um, some of that time. We're going to hear from Renee and Larry. Um, they, of course, have been very involved in these conversations as council uh, lead and elder lead. And so we'll hear from them and kind of what's on, on their heart. And then we'll talk about um, some of the changes that, that would come with this merger um, for our Liberty Ridge campus, for example. What does this mean uh, for the folks who've been gathering there, even though we've been on a, a pause for <laughs> nine months? <laughs> oh, anybody else need a nap, man? Holy cow. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that, some of the things that we've learned along the way from both Liberty Ridge and Oak Hill um, about what it means to be a multi-site congregation, um, how that impacts us, the attitude uh, that we need going into, into this. And so, um, again, any questions, hit the live prayer button and we'll be monitoring that. Um, but I think we're going to answer a lot of them along the way. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit of scripture as we get going tonight from uh, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, probably some familiar words to lots of you in the first chapter there. Paul gives these greetings uh, we always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly. Uh, I sometimes have a hard time believing everything Paul writes. I'm not sure that he liked everyone at Thessalonica, uh, but he says, I'm thanking God for, for all of you. You notice that, not most of you, for all of you. Um, as we pray to, to our God and Father about you, uh, listen to this, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I think that that trilogy uh, that he hits on there is, is pretty cool. Uh, faithful work. Wow. Uh, Woodbury Lutheran Church for almost 55 years now. Faithful work has been, been done through, through the people of this church in pretty incredible ways. And so I'm, I'm thankful as I think about that faithful work. Um, maybe I'm even more proud of, of your loving deeds. Um, so much continues to happen through, through the Holy Spirit working in uh, and through us, out to, out to our neighbors, out to the world around us, uh, enduring our, our loving deeds. And then finally, talks about the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul would go on there to, to encourage the, the Thessalonians by saying, 
Um, they've continued to keep the faith even through incredible challenges, uh, through enduring uh, suffering is the word that he uses, um, but they've continued to imitate Paul and the Lord through that time of suffering. And we all know that this is a time of challenge uh, individually as a church in our nation, uh, around the world. This is a time of, of challenge and suffering. And yet through all of that, um, how great is it that we have enduring hope? It's not a hope that's here for a moment and then gone. Uh, it's not a, a fleeting hope like, you know, I hope the Vikings don't blow it. Um, but this is a real hope, an enduring hope, and it's a hope that's rooted, of course, in Jesus, in his death, and more importantly, in his resurrection. And so, friends, we get to gather um, around that enduring hope, um, thinking about some of those deeds that he might be calling us to and how we can be uh, loving to the world around us as we talk about this opportunity um, that is, is before us. Uh, there's a few things I, I want to hit on before we uh, turn it over to John here in, in a moment. Um, one of the things about this year that, that I've felt like um, has been just this continually chasing my tail. And so when my dog was a puppy, he loved to chase his tail. And in some ways I've felt like that's kind of been 2020. And even last week as we're having to shift and change again from uh, in person to online and just trying to figure out all this stuff along the way. It's just been trying to make decision after decision to, to just figure out how to get to tomorrow. And in, in the midst of that, it can be easy to lose sight uh, of this, this truth that we're about being on mission. Uh, we're not just about circling the wagons and making sure that everything is okay for Woodbury Lutheran, but we are called to be people on mission. And we know that in times of crisis, uh, the opportunities to be on mission, they they grow exponentially, and we're seeing that all around us. And uh, lots of you received um, your, your giving statements today, or you will in the next day or two. And in that, I, I talk about some of the ways that, that we've stepped into uh, the crisis and the opportunities um, around us. Um, but this opportunity for, for a possible merger, it's just another reminder that we are called to be uh, on mission to always be looking outside of ourselves to where God might be calling us uh, next. And uh, as we've, we've done that, you know, as a church for, like I said, 55 years almost now, um, there's been incredible impact along the way. Um, I think of all the, the vicars that we've had over the years and how they've spread out. Um, during Multiply, we had a little map, I remember, showing where all our vicars have, have landed and the impact uh, that they continue to have in the kingdom. Um, I think of members who've been here for a long time and, and moved away to new places and how they brought that spirit and, and ethos of Woodbury Lutheran along with them in ways that continues to, to impact um, um, the world. And as I look back at our history, um, there have been some initiatives that have been very successful and there have been others uh, that have, have faced challenges along the way. And so it always hasn't, or it hasn't always been uh, easy, smooth sailing, I guess you would say. And yet through it all, God has been there um, blessing us along the way. Um, back in 2010, uh, when I was an associate pastor, I was working with the church council uh, looking at our Afton land. And some of you <laughs> know this story, right? This kind of continual, uh, what are we going to do with, with the land? You know, what are we going to do with the land? And that was uh, purchased, I think, in 2002, 2003, something like that. And so in 2010, we were, we were looking, you know, what, what does God want us to do? And in the midst of that, Risen Christ uh, came to us and said, hey, could you, could you help us? Um, we're just kind of stuck. And we started those conversations, and that, of course, led to uh, our Oak Hill campus in 2012. And uh, when we started that campus... Um, I kind of laughed because we had no idea what we were doing. Um, building the airplane uh, while it was in the air. And sometimes I feel like we're continuing to do that uh, when it comes to multi-site uh, ministry. Uh, but during that time, we learned a lot about what it looks like to merge with another congregation, the questions that need to be asked. Uh, and Pastor John has put those, those learnings to work over these past six months as he's been in conversation uh, with the leadership over at Concordia in South St. Paul. 
And so there are lessons that we've learned um, along the way about things that we would do and things that we might do uh, differently. And the same can be said of our, our Liberty Ridge campus. Um, lots that we've learned over the past four years. Can you believe it? Coming up on a four-year anniversary uh, of our Liberty Ridge campus. And some of the things that we, we've learned from that campus, Pastor John will unpack a little bit uh, later. Um, but you know, there's been some, some challenges that have come with that campus. Um, some things that, that turned out differently than we thought they would. And there's been some great surprises along the way as well. And so we've learned some stuff about location. We've learned some stuff about portability. Uh, We've learned some stuff about having the right mix of people when it comes to launching uh, a new campus or even coming together uh, in in a merger. And so that's kind of what's exciting about this opportunity is we can take all those things that we've learned, uh, the successes, the challenges, and we can put them in the hopper, right, and be praying about it and asking the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us, and we can use that uh, as we step into uh, this, this opportunity. Um, you heard me say it, I think it was this last weekend, um, I'm not sure, we're recording services it seems like every other day, you guys, <laughs> I'm not even sure for what days anymore, um, but one of the things I said about this town hall is that um, through this pandemic, uh, there are a lot of unhealthy churches uh, in the United States. There are a lot of unhealthy churches in our own denomination, like lots. And there are some consultants that believe that in the next 18 months that up to 20% of, of current churches will have to close their doors. Um, so just think about that for a moment. I'm not great at math, um, but that's one in every five churches. One in every five churches. And so there are going to be opportunities along the way for us to step in. Um, I think of the scripture that says, to, to who much is given, much is expected. To, to who much is given, much is expected. And we sure have been blessed with, with lots. Now that doesn't mean we're going to jump on every opportunity. Um, we actually had two opportunities to uh, partner and merge with churches over the last couple of years that we said no to um, because it just wasn't the right time or it wasn't the right mix of people, or we didn't feel like uh, the leadership was ready um, to, to step into what, what, we're, what we're asking them. And so as we think about this opportunity, and as we pray about it, um, I'm just asking that the Holy Spirit be amongst us and in our spirit, uh, that you're led to ask really good questions that were clear in our presentation tonight, um, that you would have a really good understanding of where we're coming from, and that really this opportunity is rooted in, in our vision of multiplying disciples and transforming lives. Uh, for eight years now, we've been thinking about how do we multi-site? How do we merge? We've been um, putting aside money to do this. We did that in Multiply. In fact, right now we have about $427,000 in a uh, multi-site fund that was set aside just for an opportunity uh, like like this. And so this has been a part of how we've been thinking as a congregation. Um, but to turn a big ship like ours <laughs> takes, takes some time and energy. And we've still got a long way to go in understanding what it means to be a people who are sent, uh, to be a people who are being sent out on mission, um, to be praying about and thinking about, hey, maybe it's me that God is, is calling to go, um, to start this new opportunity to be involved in it, to be engaged in it, that it's not just the other 80% that maybe I'm being called out of my comfort zone in this way to help expand uh, the kingdom. Um, I get more excited about thinking, uh, thinking about folks who we're going to be sending out than, than just folks that we're bringing in. And of course, you've got to do, do both. And the beauty of multi-site is it lets us uh, stretch and learn and grow in um, both, both of those, those areas. And so this opportunity is deeply rooted in our call to multiply and transform. Um, It is the strategy that we've talked about for eight years now uh, that God is is leading us to and directing us to. And so now we're just seeking clarity uh, around, is this the right opportunity? Is this the right time? And there are going to be challenges and struggles, and we've got lots of questions, and we don't have all the answers uh, as of yet, but we want to continue to press forward uh, and lean into this. 
Um, one of the questions that you will ask is about Pastor John. You know, he's got two calls <laughs> that he's, he's considering right now, as well as his current call here at Woodbury Lutheran. And so what happens if Pastor John feels as if he's being led to one of those other calls? Does this whole process come to a stop? And at this point, we're saying no, that we would continue to move forward. Um, again, we're not sure exactly what that would look like leadership-wise. Um, I think Mark Studelberg will be our new campus pastor uh, over there. I can say that because he's hiding behind the camera there. Um, you know, we don't know exactly how, how that will, will fall out. We're just trusting the Lord, trying to listen to his voice here and continue to uh, move forward. All right. Have I gone an hour already? I want to talk a little bit about the opportunity. And so I'm going to click to some slides here, um, work through them, and then I'm going to turn it over here to John here in just a moment. And so here, here's the opportunity that's, that's before us. Uh, we have the possibility to merge with Concordia Lutheran and South St. Paul. In this reality, Concordia would close and a new campus of Woodbury Lutheran Church would be launched uh, at the site. Uh, why would we do this? You've heard me talk about this a little bit already. Uh, we can and we must reach a new neighborhood with, with the gospel. Uh, we can transform the future of a storied church. Uh, so Concordia was founded in 1952. Um, had some great years of ministry, some great impact in the, in the city of South St. Paul. And what an honor to even be considered to step into that. Um, I think we just need to pause and consider in humility uh, what God has blessed us with uh, and the humility it, it takes for a church to say we need help, uh, but we don't want to just die. Uh, we want to keep reaching people for Jesus. And, and that's the opportunity that's, that's before us uh, to go, to reach a new neighborhood with, with Jesus uh, here's something that's interesting. We already have people in and near uh, South St. Paul. Like a whole bunch of people that are, are driving past uh, this, this church location to get to Valley Creek or to get to Liberty Ridge or to get to Oak Hill. Uh, some that are, live closer to that site. And so there are people uh, that are already there. And finally, in our, in our uh, last strategic plan, we said that uh, we, would, we would launch at least one more campus uh, in the next five years. Um, I didn't know that we'd be doing two at once with an online campus and, <laughs> and, and this, but we'll see uh, what, will, what will happen. Um, at this point, I want to turn it over to Pastor John. He's going to share some of the history of Concordia. Again, he spent countless hours uh, with Neil, who is their uh, board president, along with others. Uh, we've had several meetings with their leadership along the way, as well, both Larry and Renee were a part of those meetings as well. So he's going to share a little bit more uh, about Concordia, their history, and who they are. So I'll turn it over yeah, to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, it really is an honor and a privilege to me. And I recognize uh, as I say that, that uh, I'm never going to be able to fully capture um, just how special everything has been that I've experienced at Concordia, the amazing people there, their heart for ministry and things like that. But I want to tell you and give you a glimpse into what Concordia is like um, and give you a little bit of the history. You've heard Tom speak about this already and it's a little new. You'll see slides and I'm disconnected from the slides. So, you know, Kendall does an awesome job. They'll work with me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Concordia, like you heard Tom say, it was founded in 1952. Uh, really, it was at its height uh, roughly 20, 30 years ago uh, where they were maybe even seeing 400 plus on a weekend. So it was a once very thriving congregation in South St. Paul. Uh, and if you're familiar with the Twin Cities area, this side of the Twin Cities, you know that uh, South St. Paul itself as a community has been through a number of changes in the last roughly 20 years or so as well with massive manufacturing plants leaving and things like that. Um, and so the church has been a part of this change uh, throughout this whole entire process. The neighborhood has changed around them. Um, they've had a few pastoral transitions uh, that have been a little bit rough. That's their story to own and their story to share. Uh, so I won't get into details there, but they've, they've sometimes been mentioned in connections uh, with the decline. Um, but there's a number of different reasons that go into why a church might decline in average attendance and things like that. Uh, what Concordia is going through now 
Um, they have one traditional worship service with an occasional contemporary worship service. Um, they've been meeting in person for a, a while now, averaging around 50, you know, 40 to 50 people in attendance. Um, their median congregation age is 70 years old, and they have a part-time pastor uh, who's not called. Um, and so he's just contracted for a certain amount of time with the congregation. Uh, that's their current setting. Uh, I want to let you know where they are, though, and what what the place even looks like. Just a little bit of a taste. So you can see uh, there's a little map that I took off of uh, Google Maps. Uh, and you can see on the bottom left-hand side, there's kind of a highlighted portion that says Concordia Lutheran Church. You can notice, though, if you look up just a little bit, uh, that it's right off of 494. Uh, so this is right over the Wakota Bridge that's on the right side, crossing over the Mississippi. Um, and you go on 494, and there it is, right on that 5th, 7th Avenue exit that just got redone. Uh, brand new, super easy to get there, and it is literally a couple blocks off of 494. Uh, as you keep going through some of the pictures that are there, this is kind of what the neighborhood looks like as you're driving to the church. There's a lot of uh, first-time home buyers that live in this area, starter homes, uh, a number of different families and stuff that live in the neighborhood. When we've been there, uh, we've seen toys in people's yards and things like that. Uh, and you can see that that kind of neighborhood feel continues from the highway all the way to the church. Uh, as you can see, just kind of the picture here, there's houses on one side and the church parking lot is already on the left side. Uh, I want to take you into the building, though. Uh, this is the lobby area. Uh, this was taken a number of months ago. I think it was actually snowing this day. Um, and Tom is inspecting ceiling tiles. I don't know if you're qualified to do that, Tom, but you know, <laughs> um, this is the lobby though. This is what it looks like when you first walk into the building. Uh, if you were to continue straight down this hallway, that's the next picture. Uh, you, you get led to the, the sanctuary. Uh, and it really is, it's a gorgeous sanctuary that can seat, uh, you know, around 300 people or so. Uh, it's a beautiful place with beautiful mosaic art, uh, if you look to the right in the sanctuary or to the left, there's beautiful stained glass that's there. I know these pictures are probably just flashing by you. There's an organ that's been refurbished. Uh, I was kind of amazed. Most churches this size have like an electric organ. They have a pipe organ uh, with actual pipes that are in there. They have a nursery, um, which has a view straight into the sanctuary from a plexiglass window in the back. Um, and then there's just some very unique and special things about this place. I mentioned the, the mosaic art. Uh, there's a courtyard, actually, right off from the lobby, uh, right near the sanctuary, um, that has like this paved area that people can sit and hang out. Um, you can see, actually, if you look far enough into the background, there's like an altar there and a pulpit there to where you can actually have outdoor worship services. It's a beautiful area that's secluded by the whole entire building itself. Um, and so it really is a beautiful place uh, with so many different beautiful things about it. There's rooms that connect off to uh, or off the side of that courtyard. Uh, it's a huge building. It really is. Uh, and these are just a few pictures. Um, there's definitely some updates that need to be done to the building. I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but it's a building that's been taken care of and well-loved. Uh, and I'm not surprised after meeting a number of the different people and leaders that are there, uh, there's a lot of pride in a good way uh, in their space and the ministry that happens there. Uh, for the demographics surrounding this community, the population is supposed to be pretty constant over the next five years. Uh, I think most reports are that uh, it's going to drop nine people over five years. I don't know how you like determine that uh, nine people drop or so, but it's it's supposed to stay pretty constant for five years. There's 9,250 people that live within one mile of the church, 55,000 plus uh, within three miles. It's 80% Caucasian, 13% Hispanic, Latino right now. That Hispanic Latino population is actually supposed to explode over the next five years as well, pushing plus 20% of the demographics in that area, which is really exciting. Uh, to see that in the area. So um, that's the demographics around there. There's a bunch of different strengths. Like I've talked about, there's a large building, well taken care of. It's very close to 494, nestled in a beautiful neighborhood. The congregation has no debt, uh, which is frankly amazing to me. Um, that's, that's an incredible thing. Uh, and they have shown throughout the process, even though this is a difficult thing, can be a difficult thing, they're very willing to merge uh, and continue ministry. They want to see ministry continue 
through their church in that neighborhood for the glory of the kingdom of God. Uh, and some of the growth areas are, are just really common uh, in any church merger with a lot of churches, frankly, um, across the country. There's some updating, remodeling that's needed. Uh, it's a pretty small parking lot. They use like neighborhood parking on the street and things like that. Um, there's connections that need to be made to the community, different areas uh, where you could serve uh, so the community knows you and sees you and recognizes you uh, as a church. We want to be able to make those connections. Uh, and the church, I mean, you, you saw the median age. You saw um, the size of the congregation. They're just tired. You know, it takes a lot to run and lead an organization like that. Uh, a lot of them are in that very similar age group and category. So there's a lack of diversity, not for lack of trying in a lot of different cases, but they're, they're exhausted. Um, and so that's where they've come, come uh, and started a conversation with us. There's a number of different ways that I could highlight uh, where we fit. But the big thing that's always stood out to me um, is that we've done this before as a congregation. You know, we've, we've, we've gone through a merger before uh, with Risen Christ. We've launched a campus before recently uh, with Liberty Ridge. We know that sending a strong core team with a good mix of leaders and youth and kids and families and things like that, a good diversity really can breathe new life into a congregation. Um, and so that's a little bit about Concordia. Again, so many exciting opportunities. There's a lot more uh, that I could talk about and I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, but Larry and Renee, you both have been sitting on the sidelines and been a part of some of the meetings that we've had with leadership at Concordia. Uh, I'm, Tom, I'm going to actually just pass it back over to you uh, to facilitate this conversation in case I like sure. try to cough or something else like that. But I want to hear from Renee and Larry uh, what y'all have been experiencing with this. Yeah, so both uh, Renee and Larry have been uh, in, in the midst of this, as John has said. Uh, again, just a reminder, if you have questions, hit the live prayer button and you can type your question in there. Uh, we're still going to continue to talk and give, give some more uh, details here in a moment. But I wanted you to hear from um, our church's lay leadership as well and kind of what they're feeling about this, what they've been sensing. And uh, yeah, it'll be good to hear from them. So Renee, why don't you go ahead and, and start us off and then we'll have uh, Larry take us home. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, you know, it's it's so interesting. I am just about to finish up my sixth and final year on, on the council, on the church council, and what a, a journey and a pleasure it's been. And from the time I've had the honor to participate, I have it, been immersed in conversations over those six years about the vision of multiplying disciples and transforming their lives and all of the multi-pronged approaches that we would use to reach new people and serve them and help them and to transform their lives through their faith. And we've known for over those six years that I've been there that multi-site uh, reaching new campuses and partnering with those campuses, creating campuses, however it happened, we wanted to be able to serve more communities, not just um, the street of Valley Creek, but um, you know what we've done with Oak Hill and trying to reach in with Liberty Ridge and all of these new ways. We knew that that was an important part of the ministry. And we, as you've mentioned, Pastor Tom, have looked at multiple opportunities over the years and talked strategically about what it takes to be successful and where could we best win. And we've known that we really wanted to serve communities, ideally, at least here in, in the nearer term, geographies that are you know within reach, um, with communities that have young families, ideally, that need um, they need support and they need to know a church and they need to know Jesus and that we could serve the children, the parents, the grandparents. Uh, and that was what drew us to Liberty Ridge where all of these young families. Um, and so when we were approached about this opportunity with Concordia, uh, I think it, it, it seems like it was about a year ago at the time we thought that it looked like a very interesting um, church to be getting to know. We, but we wanted to be very thoughtful and 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 careful and take our time because we were already very much into 
Liberty Ridge and trying to see that through to completion and continuing our due diligence around that and being careful about bandwidth and how much we try to stretch ourselves. This is something the, 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 the staff and the council were very, very intentional about. And so as we've continued to walk alongside Concordia to get to know the congregation, to really understand their hearts, um, to get to know the community a little bit more, um, and now the, just the timing uh, with COVID and some of the challenges we've run into with Liberty Ridge, that's been put more on a pause situation where the, um, you know, the attraction with Concordia has continued to rise up and, and make more sense. And we're feeling more of a calling to look at it closer by the week, by the day. Uh, so we really feel like this calling of serving new communities uh, beyond Woodbury and to be able to reach into neighborhoods that need a church. And, and this church that, you know, one of our biggest challenges with Liberty Ridge has been have, having a permanent home. How will we make that happen? And so one of the biggest challenges that, that we've been trying to solve for in that scenario is solved for in this scenario. And it is an extraordinary building. It's one we could never afford to build today. Hmm. It, it's a really beautiful, beautiful sanctuary and church with so many capabilities. So, um, you know, we just uh, strategically, um, spiritually, missionally, um, how this fits within the vision, you know, it's, I think it's just important to, to share that this is not something that has been um, reactionary. It, it has been uh, very much a part of the plan for many years. It's just continuing to watch how God is putting opportunities in our pathway and calling us prayerfully to consider where we have the best chance to successfully serve those communities. You can all see. I my, would echo. Um, oh, sorry, Larry. What Renee has said about the facility itself. It, it really is a uh, beautiful church, and a the location is awesome. Uh, and as I had the opportunity to go there, I'm I'm very impressed with the upkeep that the current congregation has provided for that property. Uh, but I'm also I'm excited for Woodbury Lutheran Church in addition to Concordia, because we bring hope to that congregation, a congregation that's got a lot of pride. Uh, it's got a lot of good history. Uh, they have Packer pride down in South St. Paul. Uh, that's Wooger country. Doug Woog uh, raised up hockey to a new level down there. And uh, I had, uh, our company had its, uh, business down in that area for a long time. And I can tell you that the neighborhood is well kept. Uh, there are newer homes and new town homes in that area. And there's great commerce when you go down Highway 52 and, and up South Robert Street. So it's an area that has great promise. And uh, so we, uh, we can bring hope to that group of people. And I think we can grow that church and uh, bring back some excitement. And uh, when their president, uh, Neil Olson, came to the elder meeting this week and talked to the elders, uh, he commented about how he and his wife visited Woodbury Lutheran Church and just how it fired them up to see uh, what a church with, uh, that was alive could be like again. And so if we can bring some of what Woodbury Lutheran Church has and possesses as a church and bring that to not only Concordia, but possibly other churches, that's, that's a blessing God has given us. And uh, we need to share that. Uh, again, I've thought many times that growing God's church, uh, that can take many forms. And I think whether it's mergers or partnerships or coming alongside, there are a lot of ways that uh, we can bring the hope from Woodbury Lutheran Church and uh, help other churches and grow God's kingdom in a lot of different ways. So yeah, that's again, beautiful property. A lot of proud people have built that church up and, 
as Pastor John said, at one time, 400 people worshiping on the weekend. Wouldn't that be awesome if we could get it going back in that direction? Yeah. Well, you can see uh, just how blessed we are in our lay leadership here at Woodbury Lutheran, um, both through uh, those who sit on our two official boards, our elders and council, but um, all throughout our congregation. I still remember when I came up to, to visit uh, 12 years ago and I had, had, had the first call here, and both Steph and I looked at each other and, and just said, wow, uh, the leadership and the involvement of, of lay people and wanting to get after ministry is one of the main, main reasons uh, why we feel like God called us up this way. Um, such an example. And I've been so blessed uh, personally, and I want to say this publicly now, <laughs> and again at our annual meeting, whatever that will look like, but I've just been so blessed by both uh, Larry and Renee, uh, their support, their encouragement, um, their challenging me, all those things, especially during these last nine months um, as we've been dealing with, with COVID and, and helping keep us on track as as staff and all those kind of things as as well. So thank you guys for, for sharing with us. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to transition our time now, and we're going to talk um, a little bit more about, Renee had touched on it, um, our Liberty, Liberty Ridge campus. It's always a mouthful for me to say, Liberty Ridge, um, which just happens to be about two blocks from my house where I live. And... Um, was my seven-year-old daughter's favorite campus to worship at. I'm not sure how I was supposed to take that as uh, her dad, but she always loved going to, to Liberty Ridge. Uh, the setup, taking time to be with people like Wade and Renee and others. Um, but I think that captures the spirit uh, of what was happening at Liberty Ridge. Um, there's definitely been some challenges along the way. Um, but there's been some incredible ways that God has, has blessed um, both our church and, and folks who've, who've gathered there um, who would not have come to either of our other campuses. Um, and so I want to take a minute here, and John and I are just going to talk through um, some of those, those challenges and victories that we've seen at Liberty Ridge. And then, um, you know, what, what, would, what, would, what would this mean for Liberty Ridge moving, moving forward? And so you can move to that next slide Kendall and uh, John, I'll have you walk through this slide and then maybe just talk a little bit um, over your four years. What did you see as some of the big challenges and victories that you experienced as a new campus pastor, a new pastor, <laughs> learning and growing, uh, being asked to do a really, really big, big thing? So we'd love to hear uh, from you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, as you can see, some of the stuff that's highlighted um, it really has been an amazing experience in so many different ways uh, to be the campus pastor of the Liberty Ridge campus. Um, I am so grateful for the people that are a part of that campus, uh, no matter their involvement, no matter how long they've been there. Um, I, I frequently tell people uh, they were the ones that truly taught me what it looked like to be a pastor uh, and <laughs> kind of dealt with some of my learning experiences and things like that in the process. Um, but one of the things that's so unique and special about Liberty Ridge is every single week when you come in, there's a tangible reminder that the church is not just a building, um, that it really isn't just a, a one-off service or something else like that, but uh, it's a community of disciples seeking to follow Jesus and become more like him by God's Holy Spirit. Um, and so when we talk about what it means to be disciples and to follow Jesus, that was something that was accented in so many different ways at Liberty Ridge. Um, now, there's struggles with that when you don't have a building. You heard Renee talk about it already. When you don't have a building uh, and you're doing the portable church thing, and uh, we were at an elementary school that didn't have an auditorium, and so uh, a lot of setup, a lot of teardown. Um, we launched with a pretty small group in the grand scheme of things of people for a church our size. Um, and so that made it difficult. Uh, if uh, some people were struggling and needed to take a step back or something else like that, um, it, it was harder to find somebody who would fill in their place or something else. Uh, and you can imagine if, if you just kind of read into the situation, if I'm a new person coming into Liberty Ridge and someone says, oh, you should help with set up and tear down. It seems great. I heard from so many of you like, 
seriously, you guys set up and tear down all of this in like an hour. Like <laughs> I, it really was just an amazing, shocking thing. Now there was a system and a process, a bunch of the people uh, that served and set up and tear down will tell you, yes, it was work, but it was a lot more simple than it looked. Frankly, uh, we learned that too over the first couple months of launching, but that's one of the things that's harder. Um, I would say our portability, the, the thing that truly made that challenging was not the work, but the fact that we were only in that community publicly in that space on Sunday mornings. Um, and so for people to see signs even that a church was in that area um, that was meeting at that school, you only had a brief window of opportunity to see that that actually was something that was taking place there. Um, it, it was hard to make inroads and connect with the community without a tangible physical location. Uh, and we did try a variety of different ways between, you know, VBSs. Some of you were part of Carnival of Crafts and things like that. We knocked on doors uh, and things like that in that neighborhood. But it was really hard uh, to make a tangible inroad into that neighborhood without a physical location that people could throughout the week drive by and say, oh, that's a church because it's a school, right? Predominantly a school. And so that's what people see um, so sharing the load, struggling to make some inroads, connection with the community and things like that are really um, the two big things that come to mind as far as struggles of Liberty Ridge. The, the community with a new, like, a new grasp of what it meant to be a disciple, not just being able to come to church, but there was more of a challenge in helping church actually exist. Uh, that was a big thing. Um, we... Laura Stennis, uh, and I don't know if she's watching or not, our, our kids and youth minister um, is a rock star. Uh, Laura is amazing um, and connected so well with families and kids as soon as she started at Liberty Ridge uh, and had built a pipeline. You know, when we actually stopped meeting in person at Liberty Ridge, you know, our nursery was full <laughs> on Sunday mornings. Our kids ministry was full most Sunday mornings uh, to where we were talking about needing to add rooms and things like that. We were connecting with young families. It was a struggle to get people in the door sometimes because like I said, making connections was hard. But whenever people did come in the door, there was a really, really high likelihood that they were gonna stick around and come back a second, third time. Uh, some of you watching, I know, can attest to that and agree to that. Um, and so it, it, we really had some special and unique things. We found ways to connect with, you know, in a smaller community of people where people know your name. It's, you know, it was that from Cheers That's before <laughs> my time, right? Uh, we all want to go to a place where everybody knows your name. Like in a lot of different ways that was embodied at Liberty Ridge um, to where I felt like every Sunday when I got up to preach, I could look out. Uh, and it happened numerous times. Uh, we're on the drive home. I could list the people that I regularly saw who weren't there and could follow up with them if I hadn't seen them in a while. Um, people stayed and talked quite a bit. Um, that was a common thing. People were, were diving deeper uh, in their faith. Uh, there's been a number of people that have remarked to me that, that they've had deeper conversations with people at Liberty Ridge because it was a different, like smaller, more engaged community um, than they have at other churches. And so uh, there is a bunch of strengths that came from a, a committed group of people that was in, that are in it, um, a committed group of people uh, that was smaller so that they could see and know each other. There was that intentional connection right away that could be built off of. Um, and then I saw such a passion from people at Liberty Ridge um, to just make every single person who came through the door feel valued um, and uh, like it truly mattered. It wasn't just a like, hi, we're glad that you're here. Like it truly mattered that people were there um, and people see, saw and experienced that from coffee and treats and things like that when they walked in the door uh, to great nursery and kids ministry and things like that. Had a number of parents say, I can never leave my kids, um, but they like your nursery for some reason. <laughs> Todd Bryholtz is the one who led that group. Uh, he's done an awesome job. And so yeah, so many, I, I, yeah, I'm going to start preaching a mini sermon here, so I should stop, <laughs> but so many different strengths at that campus. Um, the big struggles were the size of the community was smaller, and so getting people on board serving as they were coming in, you know, it takes someone a while once they're new to get connected, uh, and just that very, very short 
time that we're a visible presence on Sunday mornings simply because of the way that rental contracts work and things like that with the school. Those are the two big ones that come to mind. Thanks, John. And so as we look then at the possibility of this merger, um, you can see on this next slide, I don't know if it's gone up there yet or not, um, this is kind of where we'd be moving to. I, don't, I see them banking in the back, back there. Maybe they're getting to it. All right, there it is. It's up. Um, you know, with the portability, smaller numbers and pandemic, <laughs> yay, uh, now could be a healthy time to end the Liberty Ridge chapter. And so if we did move forward with uh, this merger, uh, sorry, I'm looking in the wrong place. If we did move forward with this merger with Concordia, that means we would end this chapter at Liberty Ridge um, at this time. And so with that, Concordia South St. Paul would be a new campus, um, but not just Liberty Ridge in a new place. And this is really important, and we're going to talk about this more here in a bit. Um, this is going to take people from Liberty Ridge. There's already about 40 who've said, yeah, we would be in on something new. It's going to take people from Oak Hill. Hope you're listening at Oak Hill. It's going to take people from Valley Creek. Hope you're listening to Valley Creek. Maybe some of you have been here for a long time. Um, it's going to take, take you. And so it's going to be a campus, or it would be a campus, of Woodbury Lutheran Church. It's not simply taking Liberty Ridge uh, and moving, moving those over. And so then a key part of this transition, if you go to the next slide, would be how, how do we help take individuals from, from Liberty Ridge and make um, appropriate transitions to, to one of our other campuses? Um, one of the things that I saw happen at Liberty Ridge several different times uh, was that families who came to Valley Creek initially and were like, whoa, it's too big or I can't get connected or I can't get to know people intentionally went to Liberty Ridge because of some of the things John talked about, uh, found stronger connection, uh, found more intimacy um, in terms of relationship and those kind of things. And so they have a, a struggle, and this might be some of you out there, you know, how will I fit in if I got to go back to, to Valley Creek or, or if I go to Oak Hill, maybe I don't know anyone there. And so just really being intentional um, about helping people find a, a home within Woodbury Lutheran Church um, I love what Paul says about the body of Christ, right? It's, it's different and there's different parts, but every part is important and we need um, every part moving forward um, together. And so this is, this is a challenging, man. I, I look at John and we've had lots of conversations about this and, you know, the time. And it's like his, you know, baby, you know, you birth your baby and um, to be able to, to move on. You know, there's some, some grief there, and we want to honor that too for, for those of you who, who call Liberty Ridge home, and we're grateful for what God did in that place. Um, I would never call it a failure. God did incredible ministry. Um, you've heard me say before that half the churches in the United States don't baptize a single person in a year. Um, I don't remember the numbers from last year, but I think it was like 15 or something that we baptized at at Liberty Ridge. Um, there were new, new connections being made. Um, that campus, percentage-wise, was growing faster than our other two campuses. Um, so there was good stuff uh, happening, even in the midst um, of the challenges. Uh, but to be able to say, you know what, we tried that, um, and now maybe God is moving us to uh, step into something else is where we're feeling um, led at this point. Can and I also, add something to that, Tom? Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, I would say truly like the pandemic was the thing that none of us saw coming, right? The pandemic was a curveball in so many different ways. And, and some of you are experiencing this with kids that are in school, like just with, with schools going hybrid and in person and then distance and back around a hybrid or something else like that, like trying to find a way to work a rental out even on Sunday morning in a school right now is beyond a headache and a half. Uh, the schools have more than enough trying to keep their hands full right now. And so uh, if some of you are listening going like, wait, okay, there was really good growth, even though it was a smaller community and stuff, but like we're moving on, like the pandemic plays a huge piece in this because um, none of us can possibly um, figure out when there's going to be any sort of return to normalcy or if that's going to be a case, you know, uh, schools still are determining how much they allow people to come back and rent their facilities. I have a buddy who's a church planter out in Colorado uh, and their school said, actually, we're done renting to, to outside groups 
um, for the next number of years. And so find a new spot. You're not coming back here. Uh, there's school administrators and districts and, and other places that are having to wrestle really hard with who they allow in their building and things like that as well. And so that, that can't be understated, um, just how much complication that adds to meeting at Liberty Ridge. Thanks for adding that, John. Um, so we have a, a recommendation of how we feel like we should be moving. Again, council and elders have, have seen this. Um, we're not asking for a vote <laughs> at this time. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, this is the first in, in a series probably of these uh, meetings as we feel like continue to, to go forward and come back to you with new information. Again, if you have questions, hit the live prayer button and you can go ahead and, and ask some questions. Do we have any questions coming in yet, Joel? He's looking. Yeah, we've got, we've got some questions. So we're going to get to those here uh, in, in a moment. But we do have a recommendation, and I'll let John talk through, uh, through this because he's been working with it um, a ton. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to run through these next number of slides here, guys. Uh, so the recommendation right now, um, again, yeah, like you said, Tom, that's the recommendation. Uh, we got a long ways to go, but the thought is uh, that Concordia South St. Paul, that a merger does happen, uh, becomes a Woodbury Lutheran campus, uh, provided one, a strong launch team is found. Uh, I'm going to talk about what that is in a second, and community connection points can be identified again. I'm going to talk about that as well. So there's a number of different merger impacts. Some of this shouldn't be a surprise to any of us, right, that if a merger happened, both congregations voted for this to take place, Woodbury Lutheran would assume all responsibilities for everything happening at Concordia. Uh, leadership, care, ministry, all of that stuff um, the Concordia site as becoming another part of Woodbury Lutheran Church uh, would need to be extensively renovated uh, for a fresh look in line with our other, other Woodbury Lutheran Church campuses. There's some usability things as well, uh, handicap, door locks, internet, all that stuff that costs money that most of us don't even see <laughs> or think about sometimes. That's going to require time. That's going to require uh, some work being done there. But the big thing is, is getting ready in the process. And, and frankly, this is already starting now. Um, you heard me talk about community connections, but that's a really big and important thing that we want to be able to make community connections um, in the surrounding area. We want to find areas of need. We want to find places to serve. We want to be able to bless the South St. Paul community. Those ways need to be found. Um, so we're talking about organizations that are already doing outreach in that area. I had a conversation with someone a couple of weeks ago uh, about reaching out to teens that are struggling from uh, hopelessness was the definition, uh, whether it's depression or there's a food problem or there's a problem at home or there's a problem with friends. Uh, it's an organization that helps connect with those people in South St. Paul. And they had identified thousands of teenagers in South St. Paul who are struggling with hopelessness. And so it's finding connections with places like food banks and schools and things like that, being able to serve and meet the unique needs of the, or of the South St. Paul community. Uh, we wanna be able to find organizations that align with our heart, opportunities that align with our heart as a church, the way that God has gifted us, um, uh, and be able to have those connections ready to go from the ground, you know, at, from the moment we hit the ground as a new campus. Um, Campus staff is a part of this as well. Uh, Tom already talked about me and things like that. Take campus staff generally, right? Campus staff, leadership, all that stuff needs to be prepared uh, and trained. It takes, it's, it's different, you know, uh, as you launch a new campus, even though we'd be launching from Woodbury Lutheran Church, uh, you know, you're getting to know different people that you'll see on a regular basis, different ministry leaders and serve team leaders that you'll see on a regular basis and things like that. Uh, there's a different mindset when you're launching new. There's training that's good to go with that. Um, and so all that getting ready is going to be a part of the process. Uh, launch team, getting formed, getting to know each other, meeting together. Um, and, and our goal, uh, so this is something that, that's interesting to me. The standard for multi-site churches now, churches like ours, uh, is that when they launch a new campus, you want roughly 10% of your average Sunday attendance to launch that new campus, a community of roughly 10% of your average worshiping attendance. And ours is over 1,500 pre-pandemic, right? Uh, over <laughs> 1,500 uh, at three of our campuses. Um, and so that's 150 people. Uh, we believe in a merger that we can launch strong with a team of at least 100 people that's well-balanced, right? 
Uh, it would be really cool to send a bunch of people that are my age uh, over to a campus. But if you got a hundred people that were my age, that's not any more diverse than you know the community <laughs> is right now. It's not very helpful when it comes to bringing the diversity of the body of Christ. Um, we want to be able to have something that's well balanced. So when people come in the door, they see people that are their age, young and old. They want to be able to see kids and youth and families and single people and uh, people from all different walks of life. We want to be able to create a strong launch team of all those different kinds of people that are going to have varying roles, some of them significant, some of them uh, maybe more common, uh, that, all, that, that all are necessary to launch a church well. Uh, and so I'm going to give this invitation a little bit later, but could it be you? I know that's a super daunting question. And man, if I had a nickel for every time I heard somebody say, well, I really like Valley Creek or I really like Oak Hill uh, when we were launching Liberty Ridge, uh, I'd be a lot richer than I am right now. If I <laughs> just put it bluntly, um, the people that truly wrestled with that and maybe even gave it a chance um, for Oak Hill or for Liberty Ridge, I heard from people that went to Oak Hill as well when that was initially launched, um, were tremendously blessed in ways that they never saw coming. Sometimes it's not right um, to make that move, but I want to encourage you to wrestle with, especially if you live close or are driving past South St. Paul to get to one of our other campuses uh, to consider what that would look like uh, to be a part of that new campus. Tom, do you want me to walk through the proposed timeline yet? Um, why don't you go ahead with it? You've been more right. familiar with that piece. I got a couple things cool. to say before we hit into questions. Sounds good. Uh, all right, we'll wrap up with the proposed timeline, Tom, and questions. Proposed timeline then, this is what kind of what the mindset is right now. Uh, we're almost in winter 2021. I think we can officially admit that, uh, whether it's snowing. I don't know what it's doing because I'm confined to my basement in quarantine right now. But <laughs> so we're going to continue to explore the possibility of merging. Concordia is doing this as well with their congregation. Uh, they've got a town hall coming up here uh, in just a couple of weeks. Um, we're going to look at more community connections in South St. Paul, launching a prayer team, looking at campus leadership, forming a launch team. Things like that are going to happen throughout the winter. This is like if this continues to move forward. Uh, sometime in the spring, winter, Concordia would vote to formally close. We would vote to merge with Concordia uh, and launch a new campus that's kind of the legal process that needs to be done on both sides. Don't worry, you're going to get a say in this if that's something you're concerned about. Um, and then spring, summer, we're talking about soft launch services. So that's the community worshiping together without any, like there may still be drywall or something else like that at this point <laughs> in time. It's the community getting to know each other and things like that. Continued implementation uh, and transition stuff, building updates, renovation, all that stuff happening in spring and summer with the idea that maybe uh, we'll be interested in going outside um, and meeting other people again. Uh, by the fall of 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, none of us can predict the future for sure. But uh, that's kind of the thought process is leaning towards a public launch of a new campus in that aspect. Uh, so that's kind of the proposed timeline that we're dealing with right now. Again, nothing's set in stone. Uh, but Tom, I'll let you you'd make your comments now. <laughs> thanks, John. And again, thanks to, to John for all the work that he's uh, put into this over the last year or so. Um, you know, you don't get to see part of his role as a multi-site director is looking, um, looking ahead, contacting other churches just to see how, how we can come beside them, if we can be praying for them or offering them uh, encouragement or assistance in any, any way. And out of those conversations um, comes an opportunity like, like this. Um, one of the things we're not going to dive deep into tonight, just because we, we haven't had time to process it, are all the financial implications. Um, I can give you a little bit, though, about what, uh, what it looked like for Liberty Ridge when we launched over there. Um, so we spent about $200,000, you'll remember, we launched with to buy the equipment and all that, that sort of stuff. And then it's roughly about two hundred dollars to two fifty dollars um, a year for operating expenses, and that's the rent of the space, that's the um, salaries of the employees, uh, that's the, the ministry money, that's uh, hiring out the, the trailers to be towed. And so as we look at this place, and I mentioned it earlier, you know, we've got roughly $400,000 um, set aside. It sounds like a lot, but probably in about two snaps of a finger, 
when you put in handicapped doors and security cameras and wireless and do some work in the sanctuary. You know, you get there pretty quick. And so we're still um, kind of walking through the models and the process of what that would look like next year as we're also trying to budget for 2021. Um, as if a pandemic isn't enough, we're thinking about throwing a merger in there and trying to figure out uh, what our budget looks like in 2021. Uh, but because, again, of your generosity over the years, I'm really excited. We're going to do some um, great work on our debt that's going to free up um, some cash flow for us next year into 2021 because of your generosity. Um, and we've also, you know, set aside stuff to be prepared for this. And as John mentioned earlier, uh, one of the great things is there's no debt that we're dealing with there as well. Uh, the building has been really well maintained. We don't see any huge projects um, at this time in terms of, you know, new roofs, new parking lots, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm sure it will be coming down, down the line, but um, just wanted to give you a little bit of more information there and kind of what it, what it looks like when it comes to launching a new campus uh, financially, because obviously um, that will be a piece we'd be taking on. Um, the other thing is, though, they've got 50 folks that are regularly engaged in worship, and we sure would like to, to bring them into the Woodbury Lutheran family as well. Um, and so we'll, we'll work hard at that if this merger um, goes through. So with that, I'm going to ask our trusty assistant, Vanna White, over there. <laughs> Isn't he pretty? He is very pretty. Um, Joel Semenk, our director of ministries, and does so much other amazing stuff around here to keep our staff um, moving in the same direction, has done a great job during these last nine months of um, keeping staff morale high, challenging us, encouraging us, uh, keeping us uh, focused in ministry, so I'm so grateful for his partnership in in ministry. Couldn't do it without you, Joel. And so he's gonna he's gonna shoot some questions um, our way. You pretty much had to say all that nice stuff after calling me Vanna White, right? Is that, <laughs> <laughs> is that how that works? Um, here's a question from Rick. Um, it says, if this uh, is the model we are following, will the land get put up for sale? The Afton campus land. Yeah, good question, um, Rick. And so. Man, as we were uh, trying to think of what, two years ago maybe, last year, it feels like forever ago, um, do, went through that whole process with Presbyterian Homes and some others about how do we partner out on that land. And when some of that fell through, we did, we did some looking at what we could, what we could get for that land. And uh, sadly, it, it's probably a little less than we paid for it. Uh, even though it was 18 years ago, just because of what you can do on that land. One of our ideas, uh, I think Mike Rigg had this idea, great out-of-the-box thinker, was um, what if we divided half up into home lots and sold those home lots and kept half because, you know, are we ever really going to need 44 acres? And it turned out we could build like two houses on 30 acres or something, something crazy that didn't make that worth, worthwhile. Um, so the latest thinking has been with with what we can get for it at this point, it sure doesn't seem worth it um, to sell it since it's already paid off and we're not really paying anything to, to, to use it. And who knows, in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, um, I've got some dreams about maybe what God could do with that space, not just for a church building, but in a way that could really impact um, this side of the city in lots of different ways. So... Tom, Rick is, is typing more right now. It, it looks like he's offering to buy it. Is it? Oh, nice. I, I, maybe, oh, maybe, no, maybe I misread that. <laughs> 2.5 million, Rick. It's yours. <laughs> here's, uh, here's another question. Um, it, actually, I'm going to combine two of them, one from Ann and one from Tyler. But they're both about the name Woodbury Lutheran uh, as we're moving into uh, other communities outside of, of Woodbury, yet another community outside of Woodbury. Uh, will the name... Um, Continue Woodbury Lutheran, or will it will it evolve? Will it be changed to better reflect our multi-site campus? Great question. We are going to try to keep this separate from this conversation. Um, as you know, for probably the last year, we've been batting around this this question. Um, as I was doing some some research on it again, I, I found some of my notes from when we uh, merged with Risen Christ, and it's interesting. We were asking some of the same questions then as we are now. Um, does Woodbury work in a different community? Um, is Lutheran attractional or is it repelling for people who are outside of the church? And does Woodbury Lutheran, um, does it work um, 
to help us live out our vision in the most fulfilled way. And there's lots of, um, you know, strands to that question. John's laughing on the Zoom call. I don't know if you could see him. He's laughing at me right now. Um, what the church council is doing is we're putting together a ministry action team to dive down into this a little bit further. Um, you know, if our dream is to continue to multi-site and continue to grow outside of Woodbury, um, it does beg the question, um, will this name continue uh, to work? So it's something that we're looking at. Again, um, no change on this will be made without the congregation's involvement, <laughs> without bringing um, everybody along. It's not one of these decisions that um, I'm going to sit in my office and, and come up with the name uh, River Bend Church. So, um, yeah, something we're looking at. Great question. Um, and, and something we need to be praying about and thinking about. What helps us to best live out our vision uh, now? Not so that we can grow big and powerful and strong, but so that the kingdom of God uh, can continue to grow and more people can meet, meet Jesus. Here's a, one from Chad. Uh, he's asking, are there other Lutheran churches in the area? Yeah, so good, good question, Chad. Um, Emmanuel Lutheran, I think, is 2.4 miles away. Is that right, John? 2.5 miles away, if we really want to be picky. But uh, <laughs> they were actually the congregation that helped plant Concordia way back in the day. So Yeah, and early on, um, I know that um, Concordia had some conversations with Emmanuel about if they could do some stuff together and some pulpit supply and those kind of things. That's where, you know, a shared pastor works uh, because of their, their connection being planted by them. Um, but that just didn't, didn't pan out, didn't feel like the right direction for them to go. Um, are there any other? There's not a ton of churches in South St. Paul. John, I remember you talking about this. Yeah, there's not. Yeah, there are not a ton of churches. Um, the Catholic presence is really the only big one. Otherwise, you're moving outside to Invergrove Heights or you're heading towards Egan or Cottage Grove or Woodbury or something else like that. Um, so, yeah, it, it's not a heavily, even even some of the non-denominational churches that we see fairly regularly in, in Woodbury, places like Eagle Brook, River Valley, things like that, uh, do not have a presence in South St. Paul in particular. Good question. Uh, here's another one from, uh, from Rick. Is the Liberty Ridge community excited about this? I would give that one to John. Is the Liberty Ridge community excited about this? Uh, you know, uh, I would say some are really excited about this. Uh, some are not so excited. Um, some are sad, simply. Um, I, I will say this. I, I'll keep reiterating it. It even though it was said earlier, this is not Liberty Ridge in a new place. Um, this is not a, um, this is not just a, you know, five minute drive from Liberty Ridge. Uh, some people that are part of Liberty Ridge are having a harder conversation because we, we have a few people from Liberty Ridge that even lived in Wisconsin. Um, and so it's not a short drive to South St. Paul or something like that. Uh, and so uh, there are some people that are really, really excited um, a bunch of the people that, that caught that like momentum and, and were really excited about what was happening at Liberty Ridge and, and saw the potential of what a permanent facility could give, um, they're really excited uh, for this opportunity. Uh, some people are still trying to figure that out and determine uh, what's next for them. Some of them live really far away uh, or not so close, maybe to South St. Paul. So it's a different conversation for them. So yeah, it's going to be a mix uh, at Liberty Ridge. It's a good question. Pastor Tom, maybe if, if, if I could share a little bit of perspective, uh, we were one of the families that were attending at Valley Creek and made the decision to be part of the launch team with Liberty Ridge. And it was a big decision because we had a middle school child and a high school child who'd started at the preschool at, at Woodbury Lutheran and, and they had grown up there. This was a really big decision for us to to uh, make a change at that stage. And it was one that we prayed about a lot as a family, but you, you know, Pastor John, you asked that, that everyone be prayerful about maybe, you know, if we go in this direction, should we consider um, being a part of that launch team? And, and I will tell you, our family was so blessed by the decision. And part of what drew us was, you know, asking ourselves, how many opportunities do you get to be a part of 
bringing um, a new a church and a service to a community. It, it's a really special opportunity. We felt called. We believe in the mission of doing that. Um, but and we we really felt like we were serving. But what surprised us was what we got back through the relationships, because as many years as we had been at Valley Creek, we, we, we knew a lot of names and, and could, you know, wave to people, but we did not have that level of connection and relationships like we formed with the families that we got to know at Liberty Ridge. So I, I just can't say enough. I think what uh, excites me personally, uh, while I, I'm, I'm sad about the prospect of maybe not continuing um, the Liberty Ridge vision, the vision of serving a community is still in my heart. And so the chance to be a part of that, again, excites me. I'm, and I know the people, many of the families at, at Liberty Ridge feel the same way. We're excited about a chance to serve this community and know that we have more of the infrastructure to support us in doing that. That's really exciting too. Thanks, Renee. I didn't realize you were still on the call. I would have called on you for some of the other questions. <laughs> Joel, what do we got? We got any more? Yeah, Tom, here's a couple. Uh, I'll combine them again. Uh, they're both around raising up staff and, and lay leaders. Um, uh, the question is, how do, we, how do we multiply leaders? And sort of a, a related to that, as we've gone through transitions in the past, you know, it's put somewhat of a burden on the staff, this, this writer says. Um, are we set up with this expansion and the current infrastructure to handle it? Um, there's a concern here that, uh, that we don't burn staff out with additional responsibilities. Hey, thanks for that. First of all, caring for the staff. <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, yeah, this is a big deal within our denomination, um, especially when it comes to pastors. And we're going to have to figure out how to continue to be creative to raise up leaders, not only at the staff level, um, but this is one of the huge learnings from Liberty Ridge that we need to have lay people that are raised up and ready to go and lead and who are the ones that are bringing folks with them. Um, you may have noticed, but when we get up front and we ask you um, to do something, most of the time your eyes all glaze over, believe it or not, and um, you don't hear anything we say. But when there's a personal conversation, when it's with my small group, um, I can ask them to do something, and uh, most of the time they, they dismiss me, right? No, <laughs> most of the time... Um, they'll listen because we have that connection and relationship. And so when it comes to like putting together teams of hospitality and ushers and those kind of things, we have this, this dream where we're continually raising up people who are raising up others to bring them uh, with them, but to also talk a little bit about what Renee was just saying, to make a, a larger church uh, smaller and more intimate where we're growing as disciples um, together with one another. And so currently... Um, yeah, depending on kind of what happens with John, you know, we feel like we're pretty well set up. We'd have to make some, some, uh, some hires along the way, um, but feel pretty good about that. But as we look further down the road, um, we've got to figure out a way to get the flywheel moving here, right? As more churches are, are needing this and the opportunities come, um, we're going to have to figure out how to do it. And also look at our model, right? So does, do we have to have um, in this digital world... You know, live people preaching every week at every campus. Um, that gets complicated, trust me, trying to put a preaching schedule. Um, is it okay if once in a while we're doing a, a, a video of one of our pastors? Um, so thinking about some of those, those things around our model as well and how we're good stewards um, of the resources that, that God's given to us. Work to do in that area, both in staff and uh, in lay leadership. Great. Here's another one um, uh, from the Wilfords. Does Concordia have room for a preschool? Yes. <laughs> um, they've got three levels of classrooms. But what's interesting is, and Mark, you can tell me, uh, no bathrooms on a couple of the levels, like upstairs. And so kind of a weird layout, but a ton of space. And in fact, uh, Sarah Mals Malso, our rock star, uh, preschool director here who's been awesome this year, let me tell you. In about three weeks, she put together a kindergarten class. And so we have kindergarten again this year with, I think, 14 kids or whatever the maximum amount is. Um, she's already been dreaming about what might, might be able to go there to serve the community. Maybe it's early childhood center. Maybe it's preschool. Um, but that's definitely on the radar. Excellent. Um, 
here's, I, this is a great one. Um, how do you see the Holy Spirit at work in this? How do we see the Holy Spirit at work in this? Uh, definitely a, a, a great question. Um, one of the things that I spend a lot of time trying to be in tune with, um, as, as Renee said, over these past several years, you know, we've had a bunch of these opportunities, and it's been pretty clear on, on a couple of them, like, nope, it's just time to stop. It's not going to work. And I could get that sense as I talked with, with not only um, staff people and lay people who are directly involved, but others who are kind of on the fringes. And you know how you just get that sense from people? And I told, um, I think it was you, Joel, pretty early on in this, um, I was just getting this weird vibe from all kinds of people that were like excited about this. And I'm thinking, well, you haven't even heard really much about it or you don't even know what the building looks like or their financial situation, but there was something kind of stirring in people. Um, it reminded me a lot of when, when I was sitting in this very, very room um, in 2011, no, 2012 at our January voters meeting and we were bringing up uh, Risen Christ and Dick Cavitin, a lot of you know Dick, remember Dick who passed away a few years ago, um, stood up and said, how could we not do this? <laughs> and I was like, What? Dick would never say anything like that. And was, that had to be the Holy Spirit. And some of those same uh, movements and, um, I guess, confirmations, right, along the way as we then get more in touch with, with the people at Concordia and learn about their story, um, as we, we look at the building, as we see the location, um, as we, we hear about the excitement from some of our, our Liberty Ridge folks uh, who would be looking to go uh, to this new campus as I hear excitement from even some Oak Hill and Valley Creek people about this opportunity. It just feels like, um, and I don't think it's, you know, the food I ate for dinner that, you know, the spirit is, is moving here. And so we'll keep following until it becomes clear that, that we shouldn't. I've got one question coming in, so I want to wait and see that. But maybe you can, um, while we're waiting on that one to come in, maybe you can talk about this. Somebody asked a little while ago, is Liberty Ridge excited about this? Maybe you want to talk a little bit about, is Oak Hill excited about this? Is Valley Creek excited about this? Um, you want to speak to that for a minute? <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, again, in, in the periphery and some of the conversations that I've been having with people um, have been hearing an excitement. Now will that excitement translate into folks who are willing to go? You know, sometimes it's easy to say, that will be really great for them to go and do, uh, but I'm really comfortable uh, where, I'm, where I'm at. And so I guess we'll, we'll see that here over the next couple months, Joel, how excited we really are, and then we might get our answer. You know, maybe it's just me <laughs> that's excited about it, or John, and uh, it, that won't work too well if it's just the two of us. All right, last question. Last question. All right, it's, it's, um, it's a potentially a big one. What risks are there with this plan? What risks are there? Uh, there there's always risks, right, with, with anything. Um, there, there, there's a risk that we're in the middle of a, a pandemic and that this thing will go on and that the vaccines that are coming out won't work or that they will, it will mutate or whatever and we won't be able to meet in person for, for a, a, a couple of years where people feel comfortable um, I think there's definitely that risk. There's the risk, again, of, of moving staff and resources into a, a ministry that will take um, from other places, right? We had to make some of those decisions uh, during this, this year as well where we put um, resources. It's going to take time and effort um, and energy. Um, I guess the biggest risk is <laughs> it doesn't work <laughs> by whatever that standard is, you know, that we can't um, financially make it viable any longer and we got to close, close the door. Um, and even at that point, you know, we still have a, a great space and, and building and land and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I guess, I, I, you know me, my, my number two strength finder, I think it is, maybe number one is positivity. <laughs> So it's good to have people around me that, that show me um, the possible pitfalls. <laughs> um, but I see a lot of positive and hopefulness uh, in this uh, with the reality that at the end of the day, you know, maybe it, maybe it doesn't work. So Pastor Tom, it, it, it's Renee. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yes. So obviously uh, an important role that the council plays is in assessing risk and trying to be the voice <laughs> of skepticism and reason, uh, you know, to balance your optimism, although I would say you're also very realistic. <laughs> <laughs> but um, certainly when you, um, you know, when you look at risk, again, this is a strategy that this church has had in place now for several years, it has been saving money toward, has thought very carefully about what a successful scenario looks like. There's no doubt um, the COVID situation creates a, a, a significant layer of uncertainty for all of us. But with that comes, uh, as uh, Larry mentioned earlier, our lead elder, people are hurting and in need more than ever of something bigger, of, of a God and, and a Jesus Christ who, who they can count on and to know who loves them. And, you know, the question earlier about is the Holy Spirit, do we feel the Holy Spirit? Um, the Holy Spirit called the disciples early on to be bold and courageous and to leave the safety of their upstairs room and go out, yeah. go, right? Go. And, and we feel that same calling, you know, as we look through all of this, sure, there's risk, but we think it's calculated risk, very thoughtful risk um, that is, that can be mitigated um, to the best uh, of possibilities, really, when you look at them not having any debt, not, not us not having to build a building, um, a lot of that is there. So uh, we feel like if, with, of all the things you would want in, in a scenario, this has it. Is the timing perfect with COVID? Maybe not. But do we need to trust God and be, be bold and courageous and be willing to serve during these times and reach outside of ourselves? Yeah, I could say to that as well, like, like there's risk on the other side, right, Renee, of, of saying like, no, nope, I'm good. Like, I'm just going to, let's just stay in our, on our bubble and, yeah. you know, play it safe and things like that. Obviously, risk needs to be assessed on both sides. Uh, I, I, I help launch a new campus and I, I'm always the guy that's like, yeah, let's go, um, <laughs> as some of you know. And, but there's something to that, that sometimes there's a risk in, and sitting back and being like, no, 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 we're good with what is type of a thing. Um, yeah. From the very first conversation I had at Concordia, um, it seems like God's been opening doors, that it's a community that's very similar to ours. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's a conversation that has naturally moved forward um, and saying no or backing off because it could be risky um, seems almost unwise at this point in time, right? <laughs> yes. I had a question just buzz on my watch from our Facebook page. Um, will there be resources specific to reaching the needs of the diverse local community? And uh, that's, that's definitely one of the things that we're talking about with community connections, that we very much want to reach into uh, whatever's going on in that community. Uh, two blocks from, from the church, there's a grade school, beautiful school, um, opportunities there to get connected, to serve um, John mentioned there's a food shelf that Concordia has been been connected to. So there's definitely some opportunities to um, reach into those diverse needs. Um, you all have been awesome sticking with us. We've got um, a few more minutes, uh, some great stuff here. John is going to uh, share some invitations, and then we have a video that we want to share with you. Um, so please stick around just another 15 minutes, and then we'll we'll get you on your way to ice cream and bed, whatever you would do there. So John... Uh, why don't you take us through the invitations here quick, and then we'll, we'll get that video rolling. Yeah, three, three simple invitations for you. Um, and I want to encourage you if your natural reaction is like, no, 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 that's not me. Um, don't say that yet. Um, <laughs> sit in this and maybe give yourself permission uh, over the next few weeks just to dream about what it could possibly look like uh, to be any of these. So the first one, we're going to start with the big one, is God calling you to leave, lead, wow. Um, a leader uh, is going to lead a small group or serve team or a ministry area. Uh, there's people that, that lead, you know, the teams that help make the nursery happen. They lead in Kids Link. They, they lead with youth. They lead with ushers and door greeters, like Tom mentioned. Uh, they're small group leaders. All of those are needed to make a campus work, um, and, and they are some of the most important and special and unique people uh, with any new campus launch. And so I'm asking you already, is God calling you to be that person? Uh, oftentimes, God speaks a special 
uh, kind of nudge to people like that right off the bat. Um, and so if that's you, uh, reach out to Joel Simank uh, with questions. You can call the church office or email him. His email is on your screen there. Uh, similarly, if God is calling you to be a part of the launch team, is God calling you to be a part of that launch team? Someone who's engaged in helping make a new campus work. Uh, there's a variety of different ways to engage on a new campus launch team. Um, but the basis is, are you willing to make that new campus your worshiping community? If everything goes through, if everything happens, is that something that God might be leading you toward? Uh, again, reach out to Joel Semank with that. You see his email on the screen or call the church office. Uh, be praying about that, thinking about that. Uh, and then let's be in prayer as a congregation. Uh, we talked about, is the Holy Spirit leading in this? What are the risks in this? All of those things, it's so necessary and so important that we pray. Um, I'm reading through the book of Acts right now uh, in my private devotional time, and I'm just amazed at how often uh, it gets noted in there. Before we went somewhere, we prayed about it, and God said yes, or God said no, or something else like that. We need to be in prayer for this whole entire process. We've already been in prayer, uh, those of us who have been walking through this process, but I want to encourage you to join us. If you want to be a part of a special prayer team, um, they may do some in-person stuff. They're going to do stuff online for sure, especially right now. Um, but if you want to be a part of a special team, email call Brad Miller. Uh, his email is on the screen. You can call the church office. Um, but Brad is actually going to lead us right now. He um, is not available this evening, um, but he's going to lead us in a time of prayer through a video that he recorded. I got to watch this beforehand, um, and it was really refreshing and empowering to me. Uh, and so I want to encourage you. Tom's going to close us after this video, so don't leave. Um, but will you please uh, join Brad, join us uh, in prayer uh, for this whole entire process for Concordia, for Woodbury Lutheran, and where God is leading our congregations. Hi, this is Brad Miller, and I'm really glad to be with you tonight. So we're going to take a few minutes to pray together. Really, what we want to do is immerse ourselves in prayer and really in this discernment process we're in. We don't want to treat prayer lightly. So uh, I'm going to lead you through the process in the next few minutes. I'm going to give you some prompts, invite you to join in a variety of ways right where you're at uh, in your homes. And we're going to start with this verse uh, out of Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It's really an invitation and a challenge from God. And some of the words are right behind me there. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. At the same time, we want to take Jesus' words out of the gospel seriously, where he says, keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking. So that's what we're going to keep on doing. We're going to keep at it, including right now. And I want to encourage you even uh, and this time is over tonight, over these next days. Keep at it in prayer. So number one, we're going to start by praying for both congregations. This is impacting on both bodies, both families of faith. So let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we lift up Concordia Lutheran Church, that church family to you. Lord, this process is hard, and in some ways it may feel like death. In other ways, uh, it may feel like a sense of renewed hope or potential hope for the future. Lord, encourage them. Lord, meet them in their various emotions, uh, calm their fears, help them to see your spirit working, and to trust in you, to rest in you. Lord, your call to be on mission with you has not changed. Would you confirm your leading? Would you pour out your peace? Would you enable them to sense your presence wrapping them up as they walk through this time, Lord? And we also lift up the congregation of Woodbury Lutheran. This family, uh, as they discern the direction that you're leading them, God, is this your direction? Would you 
calm fears and renew vision uh, for what this body is called to? Is this part of your calling to be on mission with you? And if you're leading in this direction, God, would you call people to pray? Would you call people to go? And would you renew a sense of calling to be a sending place, a place that sends out disciples to be on mission, that deploys people for kingdom purposes? Lord, be with both congregations. In Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray for the community around Concordia, for the neighborhood and for South St. Paul. I'd like you to just imagine with me for a moment as we walk through some things, to just imagine the neighborhood. For some of you, that's not hard to imagine. This has been part of your home, maybe, or you're familiar with it. But imagine with me and pray quietly with me. So, Lord, we start with homes and families, people that you care about, individuals. We pray for them today. We pray for businesses and schools. We pray for the local government and leaders. We lift them all before you in the name of Jesus. God, you see the needs and the assets of this community. God, you see who's there doing good, caring for people, wanting to grow new or renewed partnerships to be a blessing and for the flourishing of this community, God, and that's what we're asking for. Lord, we lift up people who are broken, just like us, who need Jesus, who need to hear the good news of your son, Jesus. We ask you to touch them with your grace and mercy and to reveal your son to people today and into the future. And now we surrender our lives individually and collectively to you, Father. We set aside our initial reactions, our assumptions, our conclusions, God, our natural inclinations, we give all of these to you. Lord, we lay down our personal preferences and pick up the cross to follow you. Lord, we're called, each one of us, as missionary disciples to be on mission with your son. God, you're already at work. Renew that call in us. And God, is this Concordia, Woodbury, merger, this idea, is this something that you're leading us into? We need to know that, God, because if it's not, we want to stop right now, God. But if it is, Lord, we want to know and we want to be all in. Lord, you call all people you call your people to go, to send, to pray. All three are essential to your mission. So which is it for us, God? Open our hearts to ask and really listen and receive. Respond, God, to your spirit at work. All of us get to play a part, Woodbury and Concordia alike. Lord, we're so grateful for that. Thank you, God. Lord, we want to choose to rest and to pray and not be anxious. So, God, we lift up this process to you in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, we thank you for the prayer that you've given us in Jesus. And together, we pray that in unity right now. And please join me out loud wherever you're at as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> hey, it has been a privilege to spend an hour and 34 minutes with you tonight. Uh, thank you. They're telling me, look here. Uh, thank you for, for sticking, sticking around with us, uh, for being here. Which camera do you want me to look at? Oh, uh, this one here? Thank you. I've been looking at it. <laughs> Tech people. What are you going to, you can't live with them or without them, right? Um, it has been an honor to be with you, with you tonight. So grateful to be a part uh, of our congregation. And, and how many churches during a time like this get to have this kind of a conversation? Um, you are a special group of people, and it's a privilege to uh, sit in the seat that I do and to be one of your pastors. And so have a great night. Looking forward to lots more conversation uh, and information about this opportunity in the days and weeks ahead. Have a great Thanksgiving. Uh, stay safe and continue to, to follow Jesus. Have a great night.